I guess before I get started, um, just want to welcome all the visitors. It's good to see your new faces. And um, uh, just FYI, we do uh, every single week, uh, we get together Wednesdays and Sundays, and we eat together Wednesdays before service and Sunday after service. You are not required to stay for food, but you are more than invited to stay for food. Um, we do a potluck style meal on both occasions. Um, we have found that it's one of the greatest things in our life to draw us closer together. Um, uh, great worship. Worship team works hard, you know, practicing seeking the Lord on what to sing. Um, I try to produce uh, words about the, you know, from the Bible that would uh, shape your mind, shape your hearts, but you still need fellowship and connection in your life. And sitting next to someone for the service doesn't exactly establish connection. It will over 20 years, but... Um, <laughs> Two meals, and you could catch up on 20 years worth of sitting next to someone. So um, not to guilt you into it, just to explain why we eat together so much. There's a purpose behind it. The early church, um, they didn't get together without eating, to be honest. Like that was the, it was a church, a fellowship of believers. And so um, we just do it faithfully every week. If you're here today and you're visiting, um, we probably have plenty of extra food because we make a lot. And you can stay. We encourage you all. I also would, um, if you didn't notice, for those of you who come regularly, um, I pushed the tables back and rearranged the chairs a little bit. So after service, I need a couple guys to get together, kind of spread the tables out, swing the green chairs around, make it more seating available. Yeah? Yeah. yeah? All right. Everybody ready? Yeah. All right, this is the official start. <laughs> all right. Two things I want you to remember in life as you pursue the Lord. They also both pertain to today's message. First off, the Bible is telling the greatest love story that humanity has ever and will ever know. By default, no story could ever be greater than that one. It is a love story between God and his created man and his intention to be with us. As uh, Bethany stated earlier, it's, they, they liken it unto a, um, a bride and a groom. He is the groom and we are the figurative bride. It's just this covenant relationship where you're supposed to be one with the bride and the groom. is supposed to be one flesh and one mind. And, and in, in Genesis, when he created man, he said, they said, let us make him like our image. See, there's, he, he wanted to be one with us from the beginning Mankind departed from that plan, that path, and took a lot of thousands of years of detour, right? We'll skip you all that Old Testament saga, but lots of detouring, lots of, lots of mankind failing in the partnership agreement that we call a covenant, like a covenant of marriage, where a man says, I will love her and have her to hold and cherish till death do us part, sickness and health, richer and poor. And the woman says the same thing, and they effectively, like, shake hands. You don't really shake hands, but they make an agreement that both will uphold their end of the covenant and therefore they will be one, right? God made numerous covenants with humanity trying to be a good, a good groom and his bride continually failed or had, could not find the, the strength or the grace to, to fulfill our end of the bargain. So every covenant that he made, we failed on our end, although he is the best groom ever, he never gave up on his bride. It is the most beautiful love story. I know it's easy to get lost in the weeds down in some of those stories, but on a bigger picture, it's beautiful. Flash forward 4,000 years, and we get through numerous Failed covenants, and I say failed, our end failed. His end was upheld all along. And it, it seemed like, it seemed like the, maybe he was losing hope or he knew that, that mankind was never going to be able to produce a partner worthy of upholding his, their, our end of the bargain. So God, the Word of God, the word, the word was with God, the Word was God in the beginning and created all things and nothing was created out of him. This voice of God, this Word of God put himself in a woman's womb, and became a man. He became flesh and dwelt among us. He effectively became the human partner to his own deals. That's how much he loved us. We never could produce a human to uphold our end of the covenants. Jesus, if you study the covenantal deals and how they failed, he fulfilled every single one of them, prophetically speaking. Yeah? He became the human partner for us 
to be with our, our, our groom. That is a beautiful love story. God made himself one of us to be our partner to him so that we could live in the victory in that family of covenantal relationship. That is beautiful. Amen? Yes. Now, in that, okay, just quick tidbit. When you think of the new covenant from now on, don't think of a new deal. Think of a collection of all of them fulfilled, creating one perfect new covenant. It's actually alarmingly like the very first scenario in the garden where God created us just to be one with him. It's actually quite neat. But we took a little detour. He got us back on track. We're going there. Amen? Amen. All right. I make jokes when I get uncomfortable. Just bear with me. <laughs> where was I? Covenantal agreement. Yes. And uh, so Jesus became our fulfillment of the deal, creating a bride and groom scenario. Now, this is just, that's a, they give us earthly things to understand spiritual things. It's, it's not a one-to-one, -one, but just imagine we're in this beautiful relationship where he loves us and we can love him. And then, but here's the deal. When you go back and look at the Bible, there's 4,000 years of them radically failing in this agreement. And then we get the New Testament, and Jesus makes this way for us to live in the victory of his new covenant. Yet there's still letter after letter after letter to people who are in process. Effectively, what happened was Jesus didn't do away with sin on earth. He didn't do away with sickness on earth. He didn't do away with the fact that we failed in our partnership agreements with God on earth, but he made a way for us to stop failing. He made a way for us to deal with sickness. He made a way for us to deal with sin. He, may, he accomplished a lot in his time here. Now, last week, we had Palm Sunday. We discussed how critical Palm Sunday is into understanding the prophecies and the state of humanity and the unfolding events that came next to it. It also points to the eschaton of the world. Long sermon. Can't recap it right now, but it's wild. In that, you see that Jesus made choices because we weren't worthy to receive a king yet, he made choices to fall on the sword for us figuratively, actually just going across literally, to make a way for us to be one with him as a bride company, they call us in the New Testament. Amen? Yeah. That's a beautiful story. Yeah. Yeah? yeah? So the first thing I want you to know, I said there's two. The first thing is, this is a love story, and anytime you read it any other way, keep going. Keep pursuing the Lord. If you pursue him long enough and ask him to be with you in understanding the word long enough, you will eventually see that it all points to a love story. Amen? Yeah. The second thing that I said before but is critical to always remember, we are studying ancient Middle Eastern literature, the Bible. Ancient, it's 2,000 years old at this point. And it's from the Middle East. What that means for us is they not only thought completely different than us, they wrote completely different than us. Just because we translated it to English doesn't mean we, that, we fully, that we can't miss the heart behind it. More importantly, what you need to know is in the West, we are very detail-oriented, we think. We don't care if they're right or details or not, but we're very fact detail-oriented. We like historical events. To us, historical events is a stack of details that we can put in a specific order, and then we will know the truth. That's how we process in the West. Now, if you don't, I'm saying a general we in the West. In the Middle East, particularly ancient Middle East literature, they didn't care that much about your details and your facts because they didn't think that that would actually lead you to truth, right? Uh, Wednesday night Bible study, we covered this. It says that when Jesus dwelt among us, it says that uh, Moses gave us the, the covenant of the law. Jesus gave us grace and truth. Truth is not what we think in the West. It's not just literal good facts. Truth in that word, in the Greek, it meant that he was an alignment with truth, a representative of truth. He was the embodiment of all that was true. So to say that we walk in truth is saying not that we understand all the facts. That's a Western idea. It's to say that we live as an embodiment of what is true. Yeah? And because they understood that, that alignment with what is true, not just a series of facts, they write their literature to shape your mind. You may have noticed, if you've read it enough, there is some things that are like, oh, it reads a little different in different places. 
It's because they're not Westerners. They're not getting the story straight. It is a historical account, yes. It is a literal the events that happened, yes. But when they retell it, they're retelling it for the purpose of shaping your mind. Because if they could shape your mind, they can shape your heart. If they can shape your heart, you can be transformed completely for Jesus. Amen? All right. So today we're going to discuss, naturally, it's Easter, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. But as we're doing that, think. This is a love story between God and man. And, God's, this, the, and God inspired them to write this literature to shape our minds, not just give us details. Yes? Now, this is an important story in the gospel, so it's in all four gospels. I'm going to use... Um, I'm going to use pieces of the story from all, all of three of the Gospels at least. Yes? And I'm going to tell this story. That This story, actually, if I told you everything I thought about this storyline, we'd be here for weeks. I'm going to skip through and use the ones that I felt like the Lord wanted me to use today to shape your minds and your hearts. Amen? And so when we do this, I, like, I usually cover lots of ground when I preach. Uh, for those of you who are newer, if you're concerned about the, like, sometimes I just put one line and I paraphrase the context before and after, the burden falls on you to go read your word. It's not my word, job to read you every page of the Bible. You'll zone out. I've tried it. It doesn't work. <laughs> the burden falls on you. It's an invitation from God to go find it yourself. Amen? Yeah. All right. We're going to pick up on the storyline. After Jesus has had the Passover meal with them, he's revealed himself through the elements He's, um, he's stated to them that the blood, this, this cup of wine, one of the cups of wine that they did, he said, this is the blood, my blood shed for the new covenant. Drink. Yes. Yeah. I'll no longer uh, partake of the fruit of this vine until I drink it again new with you in the kingdom. It's this beautiful, beautiful story. And then he goes on. He says, uh, you know, Judas betrays him. The, the, the guards come get him. Um, they take him and they uh, try him and he's falsely accused of many things, they made up lies about him. He allows them to just pretty much take him. If you read between the lines, um, it's pretty clear that it seemed like the government of that day kind of wanted to let him off. They didn't want to deal with him, really. They, were, if you would, they basically are saying, if you would just try a little bit, we'd probably let you wiggle out of this one. And he's like, nope. Like we said last week, he knew what he was doing. We weren't ready for a king. He was making a way for us to become ready. So he signed up for this. Flash forward, they beat him mercilessly, tore him all to pieces. He carries his cross up to the uh, Golgotha, and they put it, they nail him to a cross and stand him up, and this is where we pick up the story. Now from noon until three, darkness came over the land. So he's on the cross. Some say a solar eclipse happened. Three-hour-long solar eclipse. That's a pretty impressive solar eclipse, and the timing's uncanny. But they're telling us that darkness is now covering the land because light's being blotted out. Yes? At about 3 o'clock, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma, sub... Yep, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Picture it with me. They're telling a story. Picture it in your mind. He's on the cross. The sun goes dark. The earth is shadowed out for three hours of darkness. Yeah? Jesus is saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah? Now, I'm going to take a few detours here and there, just so bear with me, but we've built a whole lot of doctrine on that line, reading it in English face value. We read that word like you would forsake, a, like if you had a son and he grew up and was a grown man and on his own and he became like the most heinous murderer, bank, whatever, you know, terrible human on earth. And you were like, I forsake you from this family. Like, you can't be with me, you're so bad. That's the way we read that word because that's the context. We kind of like to understand this weird father-son dynamic between God and Jesus. But that word in Greek actually means, why have you left me here past a certain point? It's been dark for three hours. He thought it was time to go already, right? The sun's, the earth has been darkened. The deal's done. There's no coming back from that point. Why have you left me here? 
Let's go. Amen? Amen. When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the rest said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come to save him. And then Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. Three hours of darkness. He's on the cross. He's ready to go. He made the deal. He agreed to it. Three hours of darkness. At some point, he's like, why have you left me here? I'm re- let's, let's do it. This has gone on long enough. And then at that point, at some point, he cried out with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. Now, I'm going to give you a sneak peek of where we're going with all this. This Jesus' death and burial and resurrection we will read and celebrate today. He did all of that so that you could be the bride of Christ you were meant to be. So not that I'm belittling what he did or, or the glorious magnitude of how he accomplished it, but he is doing this so you can get there. So I'm going to liken some of these things to your walk. Yes? Yeah. We're going to, I'm going to come back to this idea later to clarify more, but you and... In your life, in your pursuit for Jesus in your heart, in your pursuit to to be one with God, you will die many deaths to get there. And I don't mean the one where they put you in the ground at the end with the flowers. You will die many spiritual deaths before you get there. So this stuff is more relevant than you might realize. Yes? And when you're dying, one of your spiritual deaths, one of your, by that, I mean, it's, there's, there's things about you that God never intended to be there. There is things about you that are hurting you, producing bad fruit in your life. I, everyone has it. I can just say that confidently. There are things about you that God never intended. So he will lead you to a way to kill it off. You will die that death several times in your life, most likely. And in that dying of that death, there are, uh, there is this, we'll call it symbolically this three-hour period of darkness where everything feels like it's hard and it's gone on too long and most people desperately want to cry out to God and say, my God, my God, why have you left me here? Why won't you take this from me? Why haven't you intervened? Yes, but even Jesus, the perfect one, Even Jesus, the perfect one, even in that moment when he's like, why have you left me here? He had to give up his spirit to go. Yeah? You have to give up some things. God's grace will be sufficient. His mercy is never ending. The strength and grace and mercy he will give you in this this dying to self process, it's unbelievable but you have to let it go. He will not snatch it from you no matter how much you pray. He will give you a grace to deny it and walk out of it. Amen? Right. After he dies, we're going to skip forward to him being buried in the tomb. If you don't know, you should know. Everyone believed, including his followers, even though he told them otherwise, Everyone forever and ever had believed that when the Messiah came, he would lead the Jewish people into an uprising to overthrow, they thought at Jesus' time, Rome. It actually changed depending on whoever was oppressing them at the time. But whoever was oppressing them, they thought this Messiah would raise up and lead them to overthrow this oppressive government and then lead them into great victory. And everyone thought that's what the Messiah would do. And then the Messiah showed up and he's nice. And he's kind, and he seems less interested in fighting the Romans, and he seems more interested in fighting darkness in our souls and leading us into kindness and peace. Yeah, But his disciples, they just, if you're told something for hundreds and hundreds of years, it's, it's hard to see past it, even when wisdom smacks you in the face. So they thought he was the Messiah. They thought he was going to rise up and overthrow Rome and lead the Jewish people, and they were pumped because they're going to be like, hey, man, can I sit at the right hand and the left hand once you do that? Yeah. And then he gets killed right in front of them. They're like, whoa, didn't see that coming. But 
When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Yes, these women have come. They thought he was going to be a Messiah to lead them in great victory. They all saw him get crucified right in front of them. Everything they thought went out the window. All of the disciples fell apart. Literally all of them, no judgment. I wasn't there. But the, everyone fell apart. But these women showed up to anoint the body of Jesus. Almost as if to say, we were willing to live for you. We were willing to die for you. But we don't know how to live on without you. But we're going to come and honor what a great man you were. We're going to anoint your body with spices. They're going to they're gonna go through the rituals. and Because even though they were devastated and distraught by their what had unfolded in front of them and not being what they thought it would be, it's like they couldn't move on. Yes? Uh, they were talking amongst themselves about how we're going to get the tomb open. Um, turns out there was angels there. The tomb was already open. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in long white robes sitting at the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. But he is risen. He's not here. Still not enough for them yet. Yeah. Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Yeah. If there's two people in the biblical story that I, I, I celebrate what all of them did, I love Church history, I love it all, but there's two that I categorize as couldn't live without Jesus. Mary Magdalene is one. Thomas is the other. And the religious spirit convinced everyone to call him Doubting Thomas. No offense if you do that, but two occasions he said, if he's going to die, I'm going to die. And once he was taken from them, yes, he had a moment where he was like, I don't know if I can believe without seeing but it's because his whole, his, he had already decided, if he's going to die, I'm going to die. And then he didn't miss his chance. He didn't die with him. Mary Magdalene is a woman who got seven demons cast out of her. She was an outcast in society. She had, she had no reason to live, no purpose of being alive. Jesus met her. He spoke her name. He set her free. And she said, I have nothing other to live for than to follow you. And now she's standing outside of his tomb an empty tomb, and she is weeping because even though things didn't go the way they all thought it would go, she's saying, I've got nowhere else to be right now. I've got nowhere else to be right now. There's only one thing that mattered to her, and it's gone, and it's confusing, and now it's missing. She was going to honor his dead body, and now she can't find that, and she's weeping because she has nowhere else to go. Now, if I'm likening all this to things that will happen in your life, I beg you to make yourself a Mary Magdalene in your dying process. And even when Jesus doesn't work things out the way you wanted him to or come into your situation or manifest, even when, it, when, even when he doesn't rise up and overthrow Rome in your life, be a Mary Magdalene. Stick to the plan. Even if you didn't understand the plan, stick to the plan. Yeah. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. She's begging the gardener. Just tell me where what's left of him is at. Yeah? Be a Mary Magdalene in your situation. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Now, this is the most beautiful picture of all. Because the apostles were very important. They were very much chosen in the Word of God by Jesus. 
They were very much elected to be the foundation of the earth. Yet Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene first. And it's easy when we're in our situations and when we're in our dying process or when we're just living maybe just a life of sin, meaning a life where we're just not who God intended us to be. And it's easy to look around and be like, yeah, must be nice, must be nice. Jesus shows up for them. Sometimes it's a heart posture issue. Sometimes you got to just make him the only thing that matters. Sometimes you got to be willing to sit out of a tomb confused and hurt and broken and weeping, and he will meet you there. Yes, he has to have your heart to work with you. Yeah, he's saying, like, don't, okay. It's almost like he made a special stop. It's like, oh, don't cling to me. I got some things I got to work out yet, but I just, I couldn't leave you here like this, Mary. Everyone's confused. But Mary's sitting outside the tomb because there's no place she'd rather be. Yeah? You want to talk about a man of, a heart of steel. Jesus, heart of steel meaning like uh, couldn't be penetrated, yeah. Jesus died on a cross to liberate all of humanity to be the perfect bride of God. And he resurrected to one crying woman and still didn't lose hope. Yeah. Why do we struggle so much to believe that he could do it when he obviously didn't doubt it would work? Amen? Come on. Now, now that he's gotten Mary straight, she runs excitedly, tells everybody, Jesus is back. Let's get excited. And it says that uh, the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled, for they had fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said, peace be with you. Now, I've told you before, um, peace is probably one of the hottest topics in the New Testament. By hottest topics, I mean most repeated. It is the most common promise. It is the most repeated instruction. It seems to be so powerful that if you could possess this peace of God, that you could, as Jesus told them, release it into a household and it'll rest upon the house. You also can't lose it. It says if the household's not worthy of that peace, it'll just come back to you. One place he says, you, when you enter a town, release all that peace. Cover the town. Peace, peace. It's called the gospel of peace. Peace be with you. Peace, peace. It's, a, it's the most common. Now, he's not trying to stop wars on earth. He's trying to bring harmony within yourself. Because at the end of the day, this is a longer story, I won't prove it emphatically today, but you were made by God to be a very specific way. And that very specific way looks a lot like the walk of Jesus. Alarmingly close, to be honest. Yeah, we are joint heirs to the throne of God, it says. What he made you to be, whether you like it or know it, doesn't matter. He made you to be so much like Jesus, they would coined them Christians one day. Christ-likes, yeah. That's what you're made to be. And until you become exactly what you're made to be, there will be a tension inside of you between what you're made to be and what you are. Now, you can wake up every day and think, I was made to be a certain type of sinner, but that's a lie. You might have inherited bad habits. You might have learned bad habits. You might have just watched it on TV and picked it up because it looked fun. I don't know. But it's not what you were truly made to be. And until you step into the reality of what you're made to be by God, there will never be peace and harmony in your heart. It's worth the journey. The greatest love story of, that will ever be told, one of the chapters is God became one of us and then had himself killed so that we could be what we were made to be. Don't squander that right. Amen? That's good. Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained now, this is an important one. 
Yeah. Because if you're going to find out who you're made to be in this life, if you're going to find out who exactly, what exactly God made you to be, you're going to have to eventually run into things that you must forgive or retain. Luckily, we know which one we should do. Because Jesus made it abundantly clear in Matthew 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, they said, teach us how to pray. And he taught them, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yes, give us this, Lord, our daily bread. Forgive our, uh, I, don't, I should have looked it up before I did all this, sorry. but <laughs> Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others. And then at the end of the prayer, he's like, okay, there's one part of that you should make sure you get very, very right. And he says, to, to be clear, if you do not forgive, you can't be forgiven. Yeah. yeah. Jesus breathed on them the Holy Spirit. Now, they're told what to do with that Holy Spirit in all the Gospels, and all of it looks slightly different, but the, they're all important. Can't do them all at once. It's too much. But this one, the only one John... The Apostle John, the only one John, the man of love, the only one he included was, with the breath of God breathed on you, the empowerment of the divine, you could forgive or mistakenly retain sins. Yeah. Because he's trying to liberate us, and with that, he made a way for us to let go of our offenses, our hurdles, our the trespasses against us, he might even open our eyes enough to see how we've stepped on other people's toes and how we're not as perfect as we may have once thought. It's a wild process, but it all must be gone through. Yeah? If you retain sins between you and someone else, I promise you, even if they were 100% in the wrong, you holding on to that offense, you holding on to the most tragic thing that's ever happened to you, it's hurting you. I'm not saying you have to forgive in the, in the idiotic sense of like, oh, if I was grossly mistreated as a child by uncle so-and-so, I'm not saying you have to forgive him and then go send your kids to go hang out with them. That'd, that'd be stupid. But in our hearts, we can forgive and be healed. Yes? And our right that we feel like we possess to retain sins is probably killing you physically, spiritually, emotionally, more than you will ever realize. And if peace is the goal, inner harmony between you and God, forgiveness cannot be overlooked. Amen? Thomas wasn't there when he met them for that meeting in the midst of them. Thomas did show up and say, uh, I'm probably going to need to see some evidence. I'm going to need to see some holes in some hands before I move on with this. Now, that's why they called him Doubting Thomas. But if you read closely, when Jesus went to heal Lazarus, they said, you can't go, Jesus. The Jews are there seeking to kill you. And he's like, no, we'll be okay. And the next line is Thomas said, well, if he's going, I'm going. Flash forward a few chapters. John 14, Jesus says, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And Thomas didn't understand what that meant. None of them did. Thomas said, um, wait a second. You haven't said where you're going. How am I going to follow you to the ends of the earth if you don't tell me where you're going? Yeah? And then the next couple chapters, he's explaining where he's going and what's going to happen. But Thomas has this heart to follow to the ends of the earth. And then he watched all that he knew get crushed in front of him. Everything he thought was going to, everything got destroyed. And, it, I, and I'm inferring, I promise you, I'm inferring, it doesn't say this. I think Thomas lost his will to live. And I don't think he could find it in himself to get his hopes up again at that point. Yeah. And I think that many of us in our process of life and in our process of dying, many of us momentarily lose our heart. We lose our drive. We lose our, 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 our get up and go. And there's nothing left in us. And we need sometimes proof. And you know what? Jesus shows up for that too. Yeah? Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. He is a good God. Yeah? He was willing to show himself to Thomas. 
And occasionally, he's willingly showed himself to others. Yeah, but blessed are those who just move on with it. Yeah, don't ever be jealous of Paul for having a road to Damascus encounter. Don't ever be. He had to do a lot of messing up to get that kind of attention. Yeah. After this uh, encounter with Thomas, actually Jesus revealed himself to the disciples numerous ways, numerous occasions. Um, They often struggled to recognize him. That's another story or topic, but that's a fun one. Why they could not see him right in front of them. But one of the times, they're they're out fishing, and Jesus shows up on the shore, and he's like, cash your net to the left side. And they're like, what? That's what he told us one time before. And like, you think that's him? Like, I think it's him. They jump, Peter jumps in, swims up. They have a little fire, cooking some fish, and they're sitting around the fire talking, and they're like talking amongst themselves like, you think that's him? You think that's him? And they're like, yeah, that's him. And then it's like, oh, it's Jesus. Hey, he's back again. And then he walks off with Peter, and, um, and he has this thing where Peter has denied him before, as he was being crucified. Peter is like his number one go-to guy, his most zealous, wants to cut people's ears off and stuff for not listening to Jesus. Like, he's a wild man. And Jesus is like, you're going to deny me three times tonight. And he's like, no, nah, I'd never do that. I'll die before I do that. And he's like, yeah, three times before a rooster crows, bro. Yeah. And Peter's like, nah, nah. And then when they capture Jesus, and they're, uh, you know, trying, trying him and slapping him around and stuff. And they're like, hey, aren't you one of Jesus' friends? He's like, nope, nope, I don't even know that guy. And he, two times, and by the third time, like, hey, aren't you one of them? He's like, no, I don't know that guy. And then at that magical moment, while Jesus is getting, like, smacked in the face for being the Messiah, he looks over and makes eye contact with Peter. Like, he's that close. He's making, he locking eyes and a rooster crows. Can you imagine being Peter in that moment? While the Messiah is getting slapped around for us, and you said, I'll never do that, and then you did it, and then a rooster crows, and he locks eyes with you. Yeah? Now, we would imagine sometimes, because we have a hard time understanding that this is a love letter. We would imagine, like, Dad's going to be mad with that guy. (laughs) Oh, he caught him with the rooster stuff. But the next time he really gets alone with him. He takes him off, off the seashore, and he's like, Peter, do you love me? You know I love you, Father. You know I love you, Jesus. And feed my sheep. He does that three times, and there's a play on words there, what type of love there is. That's a no whole other sermon. But he's walking him through restoration back to who he was made to be because that's Jesus' business. Yes? Yes? And then he tells Peter, after he's restored back to his rightful place of knowing who he's meant to be, he says, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded or dressed yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you or dress you and carry you where you do not wish. John noted this. He spoke signifying by what death Peter would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. There's uh, uh, at least, maybe more, I know, very two clear cases where Jesus told them what their life and death would be like so they knew what they were signing up for. He told Paul, Paul's list of suffering for the gospel is so extensive, it's hard to read, to be honest. It's painful to think that one man endured so much pain and suffering. And then the wildest thing is that Jesus told him before he gave his life to him. He's like, all right, this is what we're signing up for. It says, I must tell him all things that he will suffer. He was making a legit contract with him. Just so you know what you're signing up for. A lot ahead of you, buddy. Peter, I I read to you the the book of Martyrs just a couple weeks ago. I read you the the story of Peter's death. It was gruesome. Jesus knew it was time to come back to God's kingdom, and he walked back into the city that was about trying to find him and persecute and kill him, and he asked to be crucified upside down on a cross because he said in his own words, I'm not worthy to be crucified in the like manner of the Christ. And he knew that was coming. And Jesus then said, follow 
me. And you know what Peter did? He followed him. Because there's something about when you taste life and light and goodness and you experience peace and harmony within yourself between you and God, there's something about it that makes the struggles and the deaths and the ends irrelevant. Yeah? I embrace these deaths I speak of because I've learned the secret to these deaths. He won't tell you what's on the other side, but it's better than what you drop off. And I don't mean a little better. I mean a lot better. And you will die multiple deaths. I don't know anyone who did it in one blow. Just like the covenants. It's not God's weakness. It's our failure to partner properly. But if you keep pursuing and pursuing and a willingness to die to self, I promise you he will lead you into these deaths. Yes? Now, was Peter and Paul the only ones asked to follow him in all this? Actually, earlier in Matthew, Jesus says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Yeah? You know what's so important about Jesus dying on a cross is because crosses is where they put uh, criminals or sinners. Criminals, sinners died on crosses. Jesus wasn't one. It's one of the reasons why he has, he's so powerful. They, he had no right to be up there, but they put him up there anyway. But this is not, you don't have the right to be there because you have sin and you have things in your life that needs to be gone. I'm not saying that in a convicting way. I'm just saying almost everyone in modern day, there's some areas to grow. So there's some pieces of us that qualify for that cross. And Jesus is saying that if you desire to follow him, you must take up this cross. Now, Jesus, thank the Lord, died on a literal cross so that you could die on a figurative one. Again, this is a love story. Amen? He clarifies a little bit the next line. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, like many things in the in the word, especially in Jesus' teaching, he spoke in a lot of parables, a lot of mystery. He wasn't trying to confuse you. He's trying to invite you into a journey that transforms your heart. A lot of the language he uses is a little mysterious until you dig into it, ponder it, sit with it, ask him to explain it to you. Take up your cross and follow me. If you want to, if you, anyone who desires to follow him must take up a cross and deny himself. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The life he needs you to lose is the one you were never meant to have. That's how nice he is. The one he wants you to find is the one you were always supposed to have. A life of more abundant. A life of light, of joy, of goodness, of harmony within yourself between you and God because he made you to be in harmony with himself. Yes? Come on. Paul wrote later, Romans 5 or 6, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we buried him through, uh, therefore, <clears throat> excuse me, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Now, I want you to think about this. His death, we're likened unto partaking in his death. His crucifixion, he invited us multiple. I didn't read the only one. He said that multiple times. Take up your cross and follow me. We're invited to the crucifixion. We're invited into a resurrection. We're invited into a newness of life. And yes, I know that in the Western world, we're taught for hundreds of years now that yes, when you, 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 you get inspired, you go to an altar call, they might vote you in depending on what kind of church you're in, and then you're then Christian, and then you go to a class and you get baptized. And then if you read this improperly, you'll think, oh, I, I, was, I died 
that day in the baptism completely and uh, resurrected completely. And have you ever met a baby Christian? And have you ever met like a spirit field been walking with God for 60 years, saint? There's a difference. There's a process. Don't let the Western world undersell, undervalue what God is offering you. Yes, we get baptized. Yes, it is a uh, spiritual happening that marks you in the spirit realm to be one with God. It is a washing away of sin, if you will. It is a burial in a sense, but it is also a, um, it is also in their culture, it would have been marking you as a submitting to a new rabbi, a new teacher. You're submitting yourself to Jesus as a leader and a teacher and an authority in your life. And if you will follow him, you've already signed up for a death. He will be with you in that death. It says, for if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be united in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, I hope I've convinced you that you should die in some areas. We're not drinking Kool-Aid, you know what I mean? I just mean figuratively. <laughs> I hope I've convinced you that it's a, a, okay. Embrace it. It's to be embraced. Repentance become, at some point in my journey, repentance became a wonderful and great word. Because I figured out that repentance is a, like, a, it's like a small version of truly dying to yourself. And if you could literally, truly, heart, felt, repent, God would let you shake it off and he would give you something better. It became exciting to repent for things. It became exciting to find big pieces of my heart that needed to go and then ask God to take me on a journey of how to put it on a cross and get rid of it. Because I figured out the second half of this verse, if we would be faithful to partake in this death with him, anything beyond that's out of our control. But it says that he will be faithful to partake in a resurrection. Yes? And just like Jesus on the cross crying out after three hours, my God, my God, why have you left me here? That's our journey and our dying to self he did all this so that we could die to self, so that we could become the bride of Christ and a partner with him in these covenants. And maybe you've been there for too long. Maybe you're stuck there. Maybe don't feel guilty. Don't let the, the devil condemn you. Just recognize that there is a grace. You understand that there's no word or instruction in the Bible that's not graced by God to be true for you. Yeah. Not one. And it says right here that you could become united with him in the likeness of death. That means that you have the grace and the strength of God to die to these things. And that means that he would be faithful to resurrect with you in your heart. Amen? I thought that was fun. Now, the first thing I, I meant to hand it on a second ago. You have to give you permission to go through process. You cannot look around and wonder why you aren't done. It is a process, but it is a journey, a process. It is a, a race that's worth running. Yeah? Paul said also, for now, I see in a mirror indirectly or dimly. Imagine yourself looking in a, in a mirror and you're kind of indirectly looking at it like indirectly would be maybe an angle issue. The other translation would say dimly, like it's poorly lit. Dimly works better for the, for the image. It's poorly lit room. You're looking in a mirror. We see in a mirror dimly. You can barely make it out. But before this, it says when the perfect one comes, it says, but then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have been known or fully known. Picture this. Maybe today in your process, you wake up and you look in the mirror tomorrow and you say, you know, that guy Matt said that God was in me and I was supposed to look a lot like him. And you, I took the Bible very literally. I used to look in the mirror and wonder how I was going to see God. It took me a while to figure this one out. But <laughs> you look in the mirror and you're looking for God 
And right now, all you can do is see yourself. And no matter how long you stand there, you're just going to see yourself. But then as Jesus comes in your life, as you partake in these deaths, as he partakes in these resurrections, you realize that you weren't looking for a man named Jesus of Nazareth. You were looking for all that was true would be in you one day. An alignment with all that's true. And one day you'll look in the mirror and you will know completely what that verse means. You will know what it means to look God face to face. Yes? Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have been fully known. Yeah? That's awesome. Not to be weird with the language, but uh, that word is used for knowing things. Yes, it's also used a lot in the Adam knew Eve and she conceived a son. It's, it's used in that manner of knowing throughout Scripture in their language. Yeah, I'm not trying to be graphic or weird, but we're talking about a gr- bride and a groom. And, and in that day, you would be fully known. This new man would be formed and birthed inside of you. This new man would be, we talk about being born again. And in the West, we do a wham, bam, package like, yeah, altar, class, uh, baptism, born again. Where'd the incubation process go in this symbolism? Yes, there's this process of which we are growing in the womb. And one day we come forth and it's a new man. Yeah, it's a beautiful picture. Jesus used, and he didn't, for all you pregnant ladies, he didn't mean this literally, it's figurative, right? It says that when when the woman is in, in birth and she's in great travail, it says that all her pains are forgotten when the new man is born. We are the bride of Christ, and we have pains, and we have suffering, and we have so much, and even on an individual level, you have birth pains right now. But when the new man is birthed, born out of you, all pain will be forgotten. That alone is worth the pursuit. Amen? For again, if we have become united with him in the likeness of death, we will certainly also be united in the likeness of his resurrection. Yes, the greatest love story of all times has started, but it's not over. The end of this story, Revelation 22, skip to the end if you don't like the saga. The whole earth is covered by glory-carrying saints of God. The whole earth becomes the bride of Christ. Now, are we going to get there tomorrow? At the pace we're going, probably not. But also at the pace we're going, faster than you think. 2,000 years ago, there was one woman crying outside of a tomb because she lost a dead body. 2,000 years later, we are literally on seven continents. That's something to be excited about. Yeah, people are converting in the Middle East to Christendom faster than you can ever imagine. It's the, it's the last 20 years, the most rapid uh, conversion to Christendom ever. Uh, the, the, the Jews are, 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 are converting to Christendom at our pace faster than ever for the last 20 years. I mean, radically converting. It's wild. You know why the Middle East is so radically converting for Jesus? He started showing up in their dreams. When the man in white, when the groom shows up, who doesn't want to be the bride? Yeah, he was willing to die for us, not so that we could go to heaven one day. Yes, we want to go there when we die, but it's more about finding peace within yourself right now. Yeah? Yeah? It's about starting an eternal life. If we're partaking in a death and he's partaking in a resurrection... Sooner or later, all that's not meant to be you dies. Sooner or later, there's nothing left to die from, really, or resurrect from. It says we can be sin free. Jesus says it. John says it. They all say it. You could have nothing left to die for and just live. And guess what you're living then? 
eternal life. And that's when you get authors writing things like, this life is but a vapor. That's when you get this book of martyrs where they're like, eh, it's okay that we're dying today. We're living eternal life. Yeah. They didn't have a weird pagan hope of afterlife. They were in it already. That's a wild place to be. Amen? So, Jesus, today we come before you. Let's all rise today. Just mix it up a little. If you want to. You don't have to. I don't bark orders. Jesus, we come before you today and we lift our hands and we open our hearts. Jesus, we invite you into our, ourselves, into our lives and our minds. Lord Jesus, if there is anything in us that is keeping us from you, keeping us from the peace within ourselves, the harmony between you and us, Lord, please, Lord, reveal it. Give us the strength and the grace to deal with it, to partake in a death. Give us the strength to not cry out, why have you left me here, but a strength to yield up our spirit as you did on a cross. Being f- By faith, we believe that in this death, you will resurrect with us. Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Jesus, we just bind the enemy from from preaching any condemnation, whispering any lies in people's ears that they haven't done it, they won't do it, they can't do it. That's, it's not about you. If you could have done this on your own, Jesus wouldn't have had to become his own partner to his own deal. It's the grace of God, which means it's the empowerment of God to come into your heart and lead you into this death. And we will die that death if we want to live. And as scary as it is to sign up for a death with not knowing what the promise is on the other side, I promise you this. If you ever step off that cliff one time, you will never question it again. So we thank you, Lord Jesus, and we ask you, Lord, inspire our hearts to be one with you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen, everybody. Happy Easter. We're going to have our fellowship meals. Going to get, they're going to get everything opened up and getting ready to go here in just a minute. If you have kids upstairs, we can start getting them. If you need prayer for anything whatsoever, please feel free to come up. We have some prayer team people that will join us. If you'd like to meet during the week for coffee, lunch, get together and pray about things, let us know. We will try to schedule it. Love you guys. Prayer team A.